hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast today. And today we have a very special guest, and you probably know the last name. Her name is Hannah Ali. She's wrote a few books about her life with her father, Muhammad Ali. And I want to welcome Hannah to the Unimpressed Podcast. How are you doing today, Hannah? Thank you for having me. I'm doing pretty good. Trying to heal from a back injury, okay. <laughs> which is why I don't have to do all the cat blow dry my hair. I can't raise my arms more than three inches. <laughs> Are you in Louisville, Kentucky? No, no, no. I'm from Los Angeles. I was about to say born and raised in LA, but no, I was born in Michigan, raised in Los Angeles from the age of three. Lived in Chicago till I was about three. When you were born, how old um, was Muhammad? Oh God, what? I'm 20. My, I think my dad was, I'm guessing I could be a year off, 32 or three, no, 34. So I'm 46. I was born in 76. So he's born in 42. You can do the math in your head. Gotcha. At what age did you start to realize that your dad was who he was? That happened in stages. So knowing he was somebody famous or important, I realized early on in life. I, I, I mean, I could have, my earliest memory is, I don't know, three, three, four, of just thunderous applaud, applauding anywhere we went, crowds forming around him and just looking at all these people like what, rushing my father, but he was happy. You know, so that's what I remember him carrying me in his arms, going through airports. And I remember how exciting it used to be in them because people would just literally drop their bags, start clapping their hands. And you're the greatest. We love you, champ. Come up to him, hug him. He'd stop. Those are my memories of him pulling over in the side of the road when we were trying to go places because people were flagging him down in the car and he just loved to interact with people. It's funny because that all came in. I mean, it's who he was as his, in his spirit. I mean, he genuinely loved being Muhammad Ali, but and just, he loved it. He loved the effect he had on people. He loved making them smile like no one I've ever seen in my life. He, I mean, daddy ruined all celebrities for me for this purpose, you know, because he's so down to earth. He was always grateful for his his success, wanted to use it for good, wanted to use his platform for good, to spread truth, to spread love, to make people feel good, to uplift them. You know, so he just made such a big deal. He gave back the love tenfold that he received from the world. And that's the stories that would come to me throughout my life, everywhere I go, you know, your father, this, and people come up to me crying. He was, he was my role model. He was, I looked up to him. I didn't have a dad or he made me feel so special. And he just, I mean, even our cook, the housekeeper, <laughs> He always had them sitting on the sofa and talking and not doing their job or telling them, the, introducing them as the world's greatest cook or this is the best mailman. He delivers more mail and quick than anybody on the block. And he just loved to pump people up. So he was so exaggerated with everything and making people feel good. And, you know, so it was his personality all the way around. But I remember more than anything, just like I said, the way that the people responded to him so young. And I knew he was important early on. And that's one of the reasons he used to sit us down constantly and remind us that the world will treat us better because of who our father was, but to always remember nothing makes you better than anyone, not your wealth, your position, your race, nothing, nothing makes you better. Your education, only the heart. So he taught us that. And Layla and I, Layla and I as a little girl watching him bring home homeless people because he thought that it was a sin to have so many empty bedrooms in our 30-room house that he <laughs> he would put them, literally bring homeless people home with. He's piled them back of his Rolls Royce. They eat with us at Carnation and Bob's Big Boy on Wilshire Boulevard in LA. They come home, they put them in the guest rooms. My mom will come home and of course freak out and put them in hotels, <laughs> so pay the bills for months in advance, you know, because he would literally always had someone with him coming home. And um, he would say, God is my bodyguard. He can't live life fearful. He loved being with people too much to do that. So, I mean, he was just such an amazing person and human being. Um, even his faults, the way he handled his faults. But he was such an amazing human being. And, my, you know, people are always looking to find some secret, do something different because you only ever hear praise. And But they're never going to find it because any secret that he has, anything that our family doesn't share, revealing it would have been secrets my father kept to protect other people. And he would just in turn look better. So it's in protect the embarrassment of other people. And he would just take on the blame. I'm talking about ex-wives, things, you know, things, how they really went down. Like he literally was such an amazing human being, such a role model and example to live by just the way he would forgive and love and spread truth, the way that he evolved in his faith and his thinking, everything, you know, he's just lived his life in this it is an open book. And um, like even my siblings and I, you know, there's Layla and I, mm -hmm. my father has what? Layla and I are from my mother, Veronica. My father had four kids with his wife before my mother and um, that he was married to while he met my mother. <laughs> and then also two kids out of wedlock. Every one of us were brought together. Like I talk about in the memoir, you know, every summer he made sure we loved each other, that we knew each other. And we just grew up friends because of it. You know, even I, I always say that even the way he handled his faults, it wasn't any secret. He didn't keep secrets, you know? So um, he just amazing. He was an amazing, amazing human being. One thing you said is about 
positivity, you know, and you think about the power of the mind, I think there's something to be said about that, you know, being that positive, you know, promoting other people around you uh, and being positive with that. I mean, I think that creates a, almost like a winning atmosphere. He changed his name from Cassius uh, to Muhammad. Was he in tune to, you know, uh, his, his chakras and his inner self? Is that something he really dialed into? Because it seems like he was living out some of those traits in a way. Um, I think it's no, he wasn't, he didn't practice any of that. But it, the reason why there's, I think a similarity is because it's just like universal truths. Yes. So he came to this earth with lessons that I think learned in past lifetimes. My father didn't believe in multiple lifetimes, but I do. And there's no way I tell him, I used to tell him all the time, daddy, there's no way your soul is this evolved. Just the way that you have, you forgive before someone even asks for the forgiveness. You don't hold on to any hate. I mean, just what he went through in the sixties and the racial, I mean, segregation and oppression and the problems. And I mean, he used to, he was able to drink a cup of water when he was five years old in hot sun, walking home with his mother in Louisville. And now the streets named after him. So was the airport. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't able to go and eat in his favorite restaurant downtown after he won the Olympic gold medal. And he never kept malice in his heart. Even when he converted to Islam, um, the nation and the nation was very militant because at that time it was needed in the sixties, you know, people were being lynched and killed, just trying to mind their own business and walk home. They're Dignity and pride and self-respect was being stolen just because of the color of their skin. They're just trying to live peacefully. And then they were labeled as hate groups because they wanted to, to label the people doing this to them as devilish. So, and it's funny because even that he didn't really believe in his heart. He just wasn't going to go out and speak against a leader of a whole nation in the movement, you know, especially when he was experiencing catching all that hell in everyday life. So with all of this stuff that you go through in life, it's hard enough for people to forgive when someone just bumps into their car or calls, calls them out of their name or, you know, slights them in some way in business. And here are the most grievous injustices done, you know, directly and indirectly and experiencing this his entire life growing up and still kept forgiveness and love and, and acceptance in his heart. And this is just, I think he brought these things, these gifts with him to the earth when he came. And he did have to credit his parents, loving, kind hearted, good parents that taught him these values. But, you know, look how many children we have. There's so many genes you can inherit, personality traits, and you have your own as well. So it's like not everyone's going to be just like their parents. We have some of our parents' traits, positive and negative. Then you formulate your own ideas and thoughts that you come to this earth with as well, your soul and your spirit, wherever it's been before. So he's got so many of these great lessons we come to the earth and still sometimes don't learn at the end of our lives. Still haven't learned them. And he he came with them, ready, a little boy, you know? So I used yeah. to tell him, you've lived multiple lives. And he had so many philosophies and beliefs that he didn't learn and read in books. He didn't have to grow into them. He just, it, it was who he was. Yeah. And as anybody, he used to always say that the man who views the world at 50, the same at 30, wasted 20 years of his life. The purpose is to learn and to grow. And his evolvement, involvement, his religious involvement, his involvement as a human being, I mean, that's all part of the journey. All of us have to go through it. But he never had to learn love. He never had to learn forgiveness. He never had to learn those things. Those qualities were always with him. So it's funny you said about reading books, uh, because in a way, I'm... I'm very similar to that. I, I believe that sometimes, you know, books that are written and unless it's just informational or, you know, history driven or something like that, you know, sometimes that could hinder growth in a way. You know, I think you do learn more about life just by living and being around different types of people in the world. So that's a that's an interesting, you know, thing that uh, I don't know if anybody's ever picked up on, um, but I think that's a pretty big deal. Well, I think that you're. A, yeah. So with my father, what I meant by that was that he didn't actually learn these things because he read them or someone yeah. in the book. But, you know, sometimes when you are reading setting, you come across ideas that were obviously learned from other people. So it's really kind of a, I think a huge blessing to have all that knowledge written down. But, and sometimes you're, some things will resonate because you already believed it. Some things you won't agree with. And then when you have a confident mind and you know who you are, you know what you're going to accept and take and what you're going to throw out, you know? So I don't believe everything I just see because I read it, but sometimes I say, oh, hey, I already kind of felt that. So, okay. Someone else came before me, felt the same thing, obviously, because there's nothing new under the sun, they say, you know? So, yeah. you know, you just have to elevate your mind to reach up to that spirit realm where the energies that are positive have to reach down to get us on this physical plane. That's what I believe. So, which is why meditation is good. You quiet the mind and you can elevate. Where's his parents from? Mama Bird was mixed, but what was she? Daddy's like, what, 40% Irish? <laughs> they actually found, but I forgot if that was on my grandmother's side or my, my grandfather's side. Anyway, one of his parents' mother's um, father was a full-blooded Irishman. They even, if you look on the news and Google it, you'll see my father went to Ireland and got to see where his great-great-granddad, who was an Irishman, married a free slave. <laughs> so, um, 
that, that was a special back in, I think, 90s or, or 2000s sometime. And he went down. I didn't, I didn't, I should have noted this down. I knew nothing about our family tree, but um, and you can only go back so far for black people anyway. But my father, um, you can go back a little further because he's got a lot of Caucasian blood not too far away. His mother's name was Odessa. He called her Mama Bird because she had a little bird nose. I think so you don't think he, how about like native? Any I'm native. sure if you did 23 and me, we'll find all that out, but I've never paid attention to it. Well, it sounds like you have a thread of the spirituality in you. And, you know, yeah. and, and it's not, I don't think that's coincidence. You, oh, you no, know no, what no. I mean? My, both my parents are very spiritual. Even though my father was religious, he was more spiritual. And he used to, we used to tease. He used to tell me I sounded like a Sufi. And he gave me a, fa- a set of his favorite books. And they're by a man named Hazrat Ayana Khan. Ayant Khan. And they're not really written. They were just his, one of his sons took all of his speeches. He lived in the 1900s, early 1900s or um, late 1800s. And I think he passed in the 1920s. I don't remember. But anyway, he said he was the wisest man in the world that ever lived and no one knows these books exist. And the reason I even have them is because he was listening to me talk about my ideas about God, religion, life. I believe all religions have truth. He said, you sound like a Sufi. (laughs) And I said, what's that? You know, so he gave me these books and I said, where'd you get them from? He said, brother, brother, Sam. I said, Sam who? He said, X. So I guess it was one of the Muslims. (laughs) So everyone was an X back then because we didn't have our names. So the whole point was the X like the mm-hmm. Malcolm X, uh, is to replace the slave name that you inherited until you find out your heritage and your, your actual ancestral name. So that's where that came from. But yeah, so one of the Muslims, Brother at Something X, gave him these books and um, he based a couple of his speeches that were famous at the time where he had, when he was not, um, you know, when he was exiled from boxing and they wouldn't let him fight because he took the stand and, or they wanted him to do boxing expositions, but uh, he wouldn't do it. He gave these speeches at Harvard University, Oxford, different leading colleges, the art of personality, um, the heart, um, the intoxication of life, the real cause of man's distress. And they were all based on these Sufi principles that he learned in this book. So that's a good example of where something comes that resonates within. And you read it somewhere and you're like, yes, I believe this, you know. This yeah, reinforces. Yeah, yeah. Kind of reinforces. The, the only book other than the Quran that he ever quoted um, and uh, built anything based on in his life were these Sufi books. And no one knows exists. They're hard to find, but they're, you can look up the man who's at Ayant Khan and find the Sufi principle. And it's funny because everything when I was reading, I said, oh my God, this is what I already believe. So he would say, yes, why are you tell me you sound like a Sufi. And they, they believed that there was only one religion, the religion of the heart, and that all religions had truth. And the only sa- real sacred book is the book of nature and love. And, you know, they, they, you know, they believe in everything positive. All religions, like I said, have their truth and you can respect them all. They come, you know, they come to different people in different times. And um, one of my father's favorite quotes was um, rivers, lakes and streams all have different names, but they all contain water. So do religions have different names and they all contain truth, just expressed in different ways, forms, and times. So even though he was a Muslim, he believed that. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, um, his religion was very important, especially in the time he was coming up. So I believe it kept him safe. It's a miracle he survived the 60s. They're killing Black people like dropping flies. Anywhere you go, all our leaders shot dead. And he walked the streets openly everywhere. He jogged mm-hmm. in the morning. I mean, he didn't hide from anyone. He said, like I said, he said, God's my bodyguard. I'm not hiding. If one man wants to get me, no one man can stop him or protect me. Only God can. So if it's my, it's my, if it, when it's his time to go, it's his time to go. So he put 120,000% of his faith in God and just walked free. A miracle. You know what I mean? It's like he survived, yeah. especially with that mouth. And I know yeah. he had a lot of people hating him that were prejudiced in those days and could find him anywhere they wanted with a, a gun. And he lived. He probably had a bunch of spirits around him protecting him, you know, based that, on. You know, Based on what you're telling me. Frozen of angels. Well, yeah. yeah, you know, it's there for history to see. You know, he's all over the place walking down. You can look up YouTube, Muhammad Ali walking down Miami Miami Beach. And it was the it's just a classic daddy just strolling with his hands, strolling with his little swag and his walk. And all the people are honking, Ali, you know, what's up? <laughs> you know, like you're saying yeah. hi to your brother coming up to the street, running across, stopping, getting out the car, shaking his hand. He's just walking and strolling. And he, what's up? Going to Fifth Street Gym. And it's the best classic daddy, you know, right out there. He, he used to love going down. And when we were in New York, oh my God, we would leave. We'd, we'd have to get escorted by horseback out of the crowd. So he'd be like, let's go down outside. And I'm the king of New York. Whenever we were flying, he goes, watch and see, I'm the king. They love me here. I was like, they love you everywhere, daddy. There's just more people here. <laughs> he'd want to come out of the hotel room and just go stand on the corner and see how long before this, he starts getting recognized. And it was always so hectic, but he loved it. And it got, that was one of the most terrible things in my, in my opinion. My father didn't ever look at anything, not even his illness as negative. He was such an amazing, amazing human being with how he looked at everything. Everything was handled with the, from a sense of just spirituality and part of life lessons and what good can come from this. You know, so he would, the, but looking at him, knowing how much he loved the people, that's became 
became harder to interact with as you get Parkinson's progressed. So he would still do it though. He didn't let it stop him. We still go down there. We'd just be holding him on each side. So in case he lost balance or something and he got to do it, just didn't have the energy to do it as long. And then when he got even older in his you know final years, he would just be in the car and press his nose against the, the window when we're driving so people could see him. I'm like, you got to stop that. You're going to cause a wreck. So yeah. on the freeway and they- honk and you know so he never he never ever changed his spirit never changed he never gave up doing the things he loved he just found new ways to change and how he went about them as his health and his and everything else changed with life and that was just the beauty of my father you know i said something about the malcolm x thing and i don't get in political yeah. stuff on my podcast but you know this is how i can phrase this is just kind of understanding his narrative and and him hanging out with your father or whatever you know it seems like they saw truth in society more more than then, then people see truth now. What do you think about that? Do you think there's something to that? Is there, why is oh, there a difference? Right. No, you're right. Of course they saw it more because they were living it. It was getting people getting away with it more. You can go and blow up a black man's house and not go to jail. You can go and chop up a little 12 year old, 14 year old boy named Emmett Till and get away with it with witnesses. I mean, it was a history. It was, it was, it, it was just an, a terrible, I mean, this was with the daily life. And if you weren't black, if you weren't married to someone black, if you didn't have a black child, how would you know? If you didn't have a parent that was actually in, in, out there doing it, teaching you this hate, how would you know? How could you expect white people or anyone of any other color to really know what a race of people go through if you're not, not going through it yourself? Yeah. Think about that, you know? So, yeah. That's why there's so, so much ignorance, especially now, because unless they, like I said, a lot of it was taught and spread and either it was witnessed or it wasn't witnessed. And you're living your happy life, your privileged life, not experiencing any of it because you don't have the best friend that's black. You don't have a brother. You know, you don't have a mixed race child. You don't have a husband or a wife. How would you know? But every other, every person that I've ever known that is of a different uh, not, uh, white that, that does understand the struggle and doesn't fully get it, but understands is because they, like I said, are married to somebody black Mm -hmm. and they have now a child that's black and now their child is being detained or beaten on the side of the corner or just like last night outside of my neighborhood. I'm close to Beverly Hills. The black man lives here for 20 years. He's pulled over. He's hogtied by the police for what? And you have my neighbor who is a woman in her 70s. She's she's a white woman standing out there like a justice warrior filming it all because they just pulled him over. Just because, like, what's he doing in this neighborhood? My husband is dark skinned, bald. He's yeah. in UFC. He used to be in UFC. Now he, he trains and he's he, same thing. They harass him coming home. I don't even know that. And I'm a black, black woman, but my complexion's lighter, like my father's. So even black women don't know what black men go through. And if you really want to know, you ask a dark skinned black person. Yeah. It's a whole other situation. So it's a lot of ignorance. And um, of course, in the 60s, right at the height of the movement, people are standing up saying, enough's enough. You're bombing our homes, you're killing and raping and hurting our, our people, you know, so we can't go to school, we can't mind our own business. They're coming to your neighborhood and blowing stuff up it's like you're not even trying to integrate so here comes this nation of people who says get some pride and self-love and respect yourself stop trying to perm your hair to look like them you're beautiful the way you are naturally put on a suit stop doing drugs clean yourself up you know so it's like and they didn't understand they didn't understand how someone could be so hateful which is why they said they're a race of devils of course not all white people are devils no no one all race of anyone is a devil but when you have this race of people causing hell Everywhere they go to all the different nationalities. And then I mean, we're all, the, I mean, at the end of the day, we're the yeah, same. We're, we're that's the same. how it was felt. That's how you know? this is how they saw it, which is was understandable. So yeah. it's so funny because then they would get on TV and say this is a hate group. It's like hate group. We're not killing you. We're not bombing you. We're not stabbing you. We're not lynching your sons as they come home hanging from trees. You know, one of Billie Holiday's most beautiful songs, Southern Fruit. Every day, black people hanging from trees just because they want to go lynch and kill a black person. It's it's insane. But then yeah. they come and they call Malcolm X. Because he's standing up, articulate, well-dressed, saying enough's enough and calling them what they were. Of course, news coverage wasn't covering it. They weren't trying to show what they did wrong. They're just now starting to tell the truth about Columbus in high school. You know what I mean? School, everything, the whole history is rewritten. So yeah. my father was standing up saying, look at this, you know? So how, look at all the heroes are all white heroes. Look at, this is all very, these are subtle but profound messages. You know, they, yeah. they made it Jesus look like them the furthest thing from any other race in the world light skin and blue that's not what he looked like that's not what he was, he was described as in the bible so it's like this is the history of white america <laughs> so here comes this inte- intelligent articulate sect of group and a man who represented them and is telling the truth and speaking out and they, then they have the nerve to get scared and think they're going to get overthrown tapping his phone lines and plotting to get him murdered and so you know that's a whole other topic so but the point is this is just the history and when we wake up and we see now you can't even look funny to black person without losing your job so it's so extreme and everyone yeah. everyone it, it's because of the history of how perpetuation 
But yeah, it was the exaggerated history of how terrible it was. If people realize that, you know, if, if you started with two people, right, and you realize that skin color was environmental and Jesus was probably black or dark or very, very dark, you know, uh, right. I don't I don't understand why people don't understand that. You know, it's like, let's look at if you started with two people <clears throat> and realizing we're all the same, we just never had that narrative in the world. And that was probably done for a reason, you know, unfortunately. We're also all different for a reason, too. I mean, cultures yeah. are different. Just with, some people relate better and you have groups of black people that might like to hang out with white people better because they just, uh, they, for whatever reason, identify better with them. And you have people, uh, vice versa. You know, there's that one couple white guys that want to be in the black crowd or sometimes it's just mixed. You have all kinds of friends, different races. Like my one of my best friends is, is a Russian. Another one's Hispanic, mixed like me. I get along with everybody, but it's okay. There's differences, just like cultural differences. So it's like yeah. you can either clash or get along. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just it's what makes the world beautiful, the diversity. But then you have so much hate and you're always going to, you're never going to cure that 100%. First of all, we'd have to start with the children and not be innate or, or um, embedded into their minds, the hatred. Or, you know, when we start like now, you start with the youth because that's where we learn it from. I mean, I've been right? saying it for a long time, 100% agree. Right, right, you gotta right. start right. with the kids. Yeah, my dad used to say that. The only way change is going to come about is starting with kids because that's where we learn everything from. And this is something I've been studying and, and you know, you know, there's three consciousness, there's subconscious, there's unconscious bias, and then there's consciousness. And, you know, if you think about your subconscious, you know, your subconscious is being programmed, you know, when you're born through your childhood, your unconscious bias is creates those reactions based on the subconscious has been programmed in your system. If people could look at how program your subconscious is and how that creates the unconscious bias you can see those separately and understand that they might be able to get be able to get the consciousness quicker and this is something i've never heard anybody talk about but to me it seems very very simple so when you talk about the young people let's start programming the subconscious correctly and then the unconscious bias will operate how it should to get people closer to consciousness quicker because you have so many pieces of the puzzle that limits that growth, right? And we wonder why we're in the position we are with differences when there should be no differences at the end of the day. That's why there's so much diversity in film now and the heroes aren't just all white. Um, yeah. All the angels are all white because that's all where that subconscious stuff programming starts. Yes. So um, in Islam, you don't have any yeah. depiction. No one race is supposed to identify with anything heavenly to where they can feel like they're uplifted beyond all others. So that's one of the reasons why in Islam, there's no depictions like in Christianity of anything, no race, one race of angels or anything. You don't see pictures. He's supposed to be, God's supposed to be above that and not equal to us as human beings or any, like I said, one group of people on this earth. The, the funny thing is, I think that people are always going to find something to be prejudiced about, whether it's a social issue, how much money you have, what college you went to, what school, what alumni are you part of, how far did you get in school? And all that's all fake. Of, that's what my father used to say that that, the know, 3D world is fake. I mean, not to put your, not to put any of your faith, any of your self worth in anything that can be taken. They can yeah. take your title, they can take your money, they can take your car. It means nothing. All of your self worth, your dignity, it should be within yourself. So, in any people should spend time just evolving in spirit and evolving in their perception of what's important in this world. And my father studied this the way someone going to school to be a doctor would study medicine because he was so famous and he had people, he used to always say, there's people falling, they would drop on my feet and do anything I say. So it's, it's hard to stay humble and you're not getting to heaven. And you're not staying in a mental heavenly state without being humble. That's why you have people that have all this money killing themselves, depressed. They, you know, beautiful things families and you don't know what the heck, jobs that people would love. I mean, and you're, people are questioning what's what's going on? What, what's it's this lack of, if it's not mental health, then it's some lack of understanding spiritually. You think that you attain these earthly things, material things is going to fulfill you inside. It doesn't. And you feel more empty than you before, before you have them. So he, this is how he handled life. This is how he handled having Parkinson's. This is how, you know, people are jumping off buildings and killing themselves for Way less than my father had to deal with in 1984. He had to lose, he lost my mother, the marriage. He lost his heavyweight title a couple of years before that. His, he's finding out his Parkinson's is not just syndrome. It might be disease. I don't know what's wrong with him. He lost, you know, all, all of this stuff is happening at once. What is he going to do now in the world? Then his voice is going. His plan to be a preacher and spread truth and do that kind of thing, which he loved to do, wasn't going to work. So he just put all his faith into God. And he, he, daddy literally rolled with the punches and he thought, well, take it a day at a time. And he didn't harp on anything. He didn't, he wasn't ever, you never heard him complain. 
complaining. He never sued the government for the years he was stripped of his title unjustly. He never went back and you never hear him complaining anywhere about that. It's no, mm-hmm. nothing. You'll never hear him complaining or making no. excuses for anything ever in history. He never did it. He, ne- he, he It wasn't who he was. So it, what's the point? You know, he didn't wake up every day thinking I have Parkinson's, why me? He forgot he had it. He would say he's so funny. I remember <laughs> in like, um, like, like in 2000, what, 20, he died in 16. So it's like 2010. And we were, Lonnie had just told him that one of the leaders, one of not the leaders, but someone um, that he knew very well, was diagnosed with Parkinson's and he wasn't doing well with the diagnosis. And um, she's like, you know, Muhammad, what, how do you deal with it? You know, just how do you really deal with it? And he's walking from, he, she's helping him walk. We're walking literally from the bedroom to the kitchen. And he, um, he just said, I, I don't know. I just, yeah, I don't think about it. And he says, does the world know I have it? <laughs> and we start laughing. We're like, what the world? I'm like, you're famous for having it. Yeah. <laughs> he just literally not forget in a way where, oh no, he's losing his mind. Forget. He mm-hmm. made a lot of, I mean, he lost, he forgot a lot of stuff. Even when I was, when I was five years old, he forgot me incarnations. So it's like my father, all that boxing and all that moving and constantly getting around in people, sometimes he would forget things, but he let himself forget. It, it, that's more of a testament to how he didn't dwell on it. He didn't wake up and say, why am I shaking? Why is it hard for me to talk? He literally, literally just didn't think about it. He just mm-hmm. lived his life. And it's such a blessing to be able to do that. You know, so um, when you see somebody who struggles, it's the acceptance. And then he would look and say, people look up to me because he, he loved to read his fan mail. And respond and have me call back the numbers and people put the numbers in there. When he was talking more clearly, he would call the numbers back himself. He got hung up on a lot because he'd be like, this is Muhammad Ali. And click, you know? So, I mean, there's actually a documentary, I Am Ali, that we did. Well, we didn't actually, the producer came to us. People think that my sister May, May and I, who were in it, did it because I lend in the audio recordings my father left me, which I also document in at home with Muhammad Ali, the memoir. But in this, in this, um, in this documentary, um, the Universal Pictures, Claire Lewins, the director, was, I mean, she was begging me for these tapes for like a couple years and I finally said, okay. But in them, in in this, the reason I'm bringing this documentary up is there's a man named Russ who was from the UK, British guy, nice white guy, real sweet. Um, and he, he, when I was a little girl, my father opened one of his fan mail and sure enough, it was this man named Russ, left his phone number, daddy calls him back, invites him to come stay in our house, which he did for like two weeks, told him to bring his camera and film the whole experience so people believe that he was really here. And he did it. So he ends up resurfacing and he, he gives the he gives this footage to Claire and it's in the film. And it's so funny because you know, it's us, me and Layla dr- running around looking crazy as kids and daddy and his Rolls Royce taking Russ down to the uh, magic shop he liked to go to on Hollywood Boulevard. He's in our house and eating breakfast and in my dad's office and he's talking to him and they're just shooting it up, talking about how I was a stranger. I just sent a fan mail, you know, and this is the things, these are the things my father did. One of his best friends, or good friends, Tim Shanahan, we grew up with, same thing, walked up to our door in Chicago when I was three years old, knocked on the door and stayed friends with my father and my dad just liked him and they, they meshed well. Tim was funny. He liked funny people down to earth he's another white guy and tim we grew up with tim he's like a second dad and he literally just got my dad's address and knocked on the door daddy opened the door wearing his robe in 1977 or <laughs> it was hilarious yeah, that's wild <laughs> and they've been friends ever since tim and helga and just a random white guy that walked on knocking on the door <laughs> That's so that crazy. just goes to show you what I'm talking about, you know? So there's more people that way. And certain people actually stuck around with my dad just for whatever reason, their personalities clicked and you like them. And um, it's so funny because, uh, I mean, some people turn out to be crazy. You know, we got all kinds of crazy stories because, like I said, we had an open door to our home. There was an open door to his heart. He just came down to this earth and had a ball being Muhammad Ali. He loved it. And he looked at it as a job. He used to say, I'm the daddy to the world because people look up to me and he tried to be a good world role model. And if you just took the clips from all of the trying moments in his life and history, even how he handled loss so gracefully, you know, we're all going to lose in life. Everyone gets over. We're going to lose our parents, lose our health, lose our wealth. This is just another part of life. I'm going to come back. I'm going to start all over again. He was such a role model, you know? So in, in yeah. every aspect of life that we have to deal with as human beings, sickness, illness, health, loss, aging, um, charity, giving, forgiveness. He was just one of the most beautiful compliments I've ever heard someone give my father. I, I wish I could remember it exactly. It was someone famous. Um, I quoted it in one of my four books. I don't remember <laughs> it might have been Dick Gregory. He said, a political activist, um, he he said, you know, if aliens from outer space, it went something like this, had to come down. We had to show you just one human being as a representative of what we're capable of as a human, as a human race, our capacity for love, our, our athleticism, our spirituality, our faith, our humor. Our, I mean, it would be Muhammad Ali. And that was the most true thing I've ever heard. He was so well-rounded in every way as a human being. 
that had flaws, even his flaws, I admired how he handled them. I mean, everything about my father, his major flaw was women. I mean, what man doesn't have that? He loves women. <laughs> but he, wasn't, he wasn't disrespectful, you yeah. know? Loved yeah. every, every wife, every divorce handled out of court. He never raised his hand and hit any physically abused anyone, never did anything wrong, didn't abuse his power. He he literally, he just was an amazing human being. I mean, daddy literally, that was one in a trillion, billion, gazillion, one of a kind, no one like him on earth ever, you know, will be yeah. like on so many ways. And people that really knew him know that too, because what you saw is what you got at home. He, you know, he, he was just, he's amazing. And then uh, with all of that, he was so humble, which is so funny because people that don't know him see him on the TV uh, bragging about being the greatest. And he, of course he believed he was great, but he's also trying to sell tickets and he was also trying to promote black pride. So he had multiple 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 purposes going and at the same time do they really still know me he would say do people still love me do they remember me i'm like are you kidding me you know so yeah. he was just so humble and grateful so grateful to have had that love and that attention but you know you know from an early age he knew he was here to do something great he didn't know what it was and he just he talked about that a lot in life and um it came to him you know um through the bike being stolen and then learned to box you know and it was a platform but he always wanted to be a businessman he always had a suitcase and he it wasn't well did he wasn't educated in school very well. It was hard. He almost didn't even gra graduate high school. And he, but he still seems so articulate because he learned from the world. He was just, he had a different type of um, wisdom and um, intelligence that wasn't taught in, in, in schooling, which is interesting because a lot of people that don't finish school or don't do well in school sound uneducated, but he sounded so articulate and educated. But that was just another gift that he was born with. So he was like, yeah. <laughs> It was probably, I mean, like I said, that yeah. that voice was, it probably was coming from a higher place, uh, you know? I, I mean, I believe well, yeah, that 100%. In, 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 his spirit, in his spirit of who he was, yes, which is a absolutely. human being, and um, learned from the world and was very articulate. And it's so funny, he wasn't afraid or ashamed of it either. He'd tell you, like, I remember there's one interview he's doing, and he's just so beautiful, and he's sitting there, and he's just not even the champion of the world yet. And he said, you're very articulate. He said, yeah, no, truculent. He said, you're very truculent. He goes, well, whatever truculent means, if it's good, I'm back. <laughs> So I nice. love it. That's classic daddy, a perfect example, you know? <laughs> so. I mean, I know you wrote a, several books uh, about your father. Um, do you want to tell oh. us where we find those books well, and what they sure, are well, and so forth? Sure. The very first book was not even, I just put it, I, I literally didn't know what to get my dad for Father's Day because he didn't care about things. So we'd either get him pictures and print them out or we'd get him candy or magic tricks. He, you know, he didn't care about material things. So it was always like something like, you know, what to get daddy, you know? <laughs> Yeah. So I put together a book. Uh, well, I didn't put the book together. I went to Kinko's and actually put together a bunch of memories. And I was going to give him that as a Father's Day gift. My mom's like, this could be a little book, which it turned out to be called More Than a Hero. And that was in 2000 or 2001. And then, um, I don't know, you have to Google that one. Um, I don't know if it's still in print, but you can, people, it can be purchased on online. Then there is, it's like a coffee table little book. The second one I wrote for my dad, it was by him. A publisher contacted me and said, we want a book on spirituality by your father. And I said, daddy, want to do a book? He's like, sure. So that one is called The Soul of a Butterfly. And that is reflections on the important parts of his life, the things, the defining moments. So it's little sort of like essays in the form of a book on different topics. It's not a biography, autobiography type. It's a, it's literally just reflections on the defining moments, how he felt about Malcolm X, how his regrets about turning his back on Malcolm. Um, and then he died before he could actually make peace with him. Um, you know, this the racism in the world, how he handled that. It's literally reflections of what lessons he learned from the things that shaped him um being turned away from his idol when he was a little boy when he asked for an autograph which is why he can't refuse a single autograph couldn't refuse a single autograph because of what happened to him and the feeling he had when sugar ray robinson told him no he's on the way to go to the olympics and he stood outside that club waiting for sugar ray it's called sugar rays in new york all night and he said i don't have time kid and he never forgot that feeling and then it's funny because they ended up being friends later and sugar ray's in his corner when he became cha champion of the world but because of that experience it shaped him in the future. He had never turned down one. I mean, people come up to us when we're eating and he wouldn't turn them away. He'd stop eating, put his fork down, I'm not kidding you, and sign the autograph. We would get annoyed like people were that rude, but we wouldn't express it to them because our father would get upset. So uh -huh. we, we just let him do it, respecting him. You know, so even when he was under contract to sign autographs in bulk, you're not supposed to sign autographs on the street when you do that. You have a contract. Of course, he's, he's I'm rich enough. Or the, my, you know, my stepmom and my, 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 my uncle, people, whoever was around him would try to say, Daddy, they're just going to sell it. He goes, well, good. I'm rich enough. Let him sell it. Then he'd sign double the amount so they could go make money. <laughs> so, but um, he, so anyway, I'm going, I'm going on tangent. So my, the book 
that I slaved over the most, though, was my memoir called At Home with Muhammad Ali. And that is super long. It's like 340 pages. There's pictures spread throughout to go with the stories. And I'm threading telling the story, literally, because I'm incorporating audio that my father left. And he's trying to free hostages in Tehran. He's worrying about money, finances, trying to plot his comeback to the ring. Wants Don King to be the one who approaches him. So it looks like they challenged him with it. There's all this. He's calling celebrities and he's wishing people Merry Christmases. And he's talking and he's singing with me as a little girl and talking to my mother about his mother and his father about infidelity i mean he's he's tape recording so much so what i did was i wanted to read like a novel so i tell the story of of my father what he was going through at this the end of his career when he started to lose his voice and he had parkinson's in his last two fights no one knew you know but he his voice is slurring no one knows what's wrong they think he's tired he's even saying it on some of the tapes like i can't hear myself too good sometimes and no one knows what's wrong you know so i'm documenting the relationship he had with my mother the relationship i had with my father and what my father was going through and things that were happening around the house and in the world at the time what he was behind the scenes it's all behind the scenes and i do it to make it even more authentic is it's like you feel like you're going back in time because I use that the dialogue is actually the audio recordings gotcha. so whenever I get in to my fault, the topics I'm talking about. I literally went to storage with my mother one day. This is how this book ch- morphed and turned into what it was. And she found an old box of love letters that I have right here that my father wrote to my mom and never gave them to her, asking for another chance after she wanted a divorce. Because they were still friends. They still showed up places together. They were friends. They lived together for two years before the divorce was final. I forgot what the holdup had to do with, but they still made appearances after they announced the divorce for two years. It was not final until night 86. They announced it in 80, in I think, uh, June of 84. So here's all these love letters and she's crying. I'm like, what is it? And she just drops them and goes to the bathroom. She liked to cry in private. And I picked them up and I saw all these love letters. They're beautiful. How she helped him with Z- win the fight in Zaire and one of them. And just beautiful handwritten love letters. And please give me one more chance. I'm so sorry. He's one for the infidelities. And I, I can't, I, you know, it breaks my heart that I can't sleep with you anymore. And poems. He tried poems are hilarious. <laughs> the poems are hilarious. <laughs> I mean, his poems were ringing and the fighting were funny, but the love poems. So I scanned these and put them at the back of the book so some people can see the authenticity, the authenticity of them because I'm I'm quoting them in the book. And nice. uh, they're so good that you would think it was made up. I said, I got to show this. It's real, you know? So I nice. literally want to document the beauty of the love, of the the, the, the the childhood that I had living in Fremont Place for those 10 years. It was so, so wonderful. And it was so much fun. It was so full of life and people coming and going. And um, my sister's visiting for the summer. My father was hilarious. And I remember Michael Jackson came over one day and I asked him why he talked like a girl the last time he ever came over. At least they let me around him. <laughs> so it's just a beautiful tribute to my home, my, just everything that was going on behind the scenes at home with my father in his private life, with my mother, like I said, with him in the world, his plotting, his return to the ring, as we know that didn't end well. Um, people trying to convince him not to do it. Just It was just amazing. The phone was always ringing off the hook. And I did it. I wrote it by myself. Artistic. I tried to do it very poetically and very... Um, like I said, so that it reads more like a novel. So I come home, I literally recount what happened. Um, you know, I came home from storage with a box of old interviews and these love letters. And I read one of the newspapers to start the story going so that I can go back in time and explain what really happened around that. And then I use the audio, use my memories, and you get that back and forth. And me coming back to the present at home, it all takes place in one day. Um, and it leads up to me just talking to my mom about her leaving my father which broke my heart. Why? You know, she didn't give me another chance. But you're going back in time constantly to different points in time. Um, it's thread nice. throughout the whole book. Yeah. So you don't get bored. You know what I mean? There's three storylines yeah. you're reading basically. Um, long book. But that's why I read. I love to read all of the comments that people write. And they're like, oh, beautifully written. We love this. Oh my God, this is more than a memoir. Not what we thought, you know. I guess they have it in the biography free section, which is stupid. It's a memoir. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> it's, nice. Um, well, it's not, yeah. I mean, the stories sound very, very intriguing, and I'm, I'm sure uh, that you know, following that journey yeah. is pretty amazing. Right, it was, and that's called "At Home with Muhammad Ali: A Memoir of Love, Loss, and Forgiveness." It was published in the UK first by um, Penguin Random House, and out here, uh, Harper Collins, in uh, following year, a couple years ago. But nice. the audio version, if people like audiobooks, oh my God, my sisters have listened to it like three times. Like we love this because I found I tracked down this woman that my father and I loved her voice, Kim Stoughton, and she does a lot of Octavia Butler's books. It's a beautiful voice, and um, they're very they're period pieces. A lot of them slave in slave time so when she had to re- do re- read it over a few times because it kind of sounded like a southern slave <laughs> my father yeah. was like no 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 he didn't sound that country but she really nailed it for a woman and she has a beautiful speaking voice she's a great uh voice actor so i knew that there was so much acting in this this memoir because of my audio recordings and um the motion 
in the writing, I thought, I can't do this read. You know, I just read at the very, very end the epilogue and I had her do the read and it is like listening. You know, I, I, she, she reads a little slow. So all I do is put it up like to 1.2 speed and it makes the difference. And people even noted that you just speed it up. It's better. Um, it gets by quicker, a little quicker, but it's, it's amazing the audio because of that. And then you act, you get to listen to some of the actual audios in the in at the end of the book, five minutes I put in there. Me and my dad talking when I was three, and then of him telling me why he made these tapes, which is absolutely heartbreaking and beautiful what he says. So that's nice. the perk in getting the audio version of it. And you know, this is all at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, anywhere books are sold. Um, all books are all my books are available there. I also have, I also have another book called Ali on Ali. It's a coffee table. It's a collaboration I do with another another uh, writer, and it's more so, you know just why he said what he said when he said it in history, famous little quotes here and there, and it gives you the background of why he said it. So those are my four books. I'm currently writing something that my dad and I were working on together before he passed away. It was a it was a graphic memoir. And let me ask you your opinion really quick. Yes. So uh, we were looking for titles, right? So originally it was called, it was called uh, Becoming the Greatest. And that got taken when another memoir came, another book came out and they called it Becoming Muhammad Ali. And I thought, darn it. So then I was like, well, what am I going to call it? You know, beyond the glory, beyond the ring. I was like, That's too cliche and it's taken anyway. And then I came up with the Louisville Kid or the Louisville Kid, um, the evolution of Cassius Clay. What do you think? Do you like Evolu- it? Evolution of Cassius Clay? Evolution of Cassius Clay. The Play evolution the of Cassius This is it. This is a, now mind you, this is not a book. This is, this is not a typical book. This is a graphic memoir telling his entire life story. So I thought, okay, and it starts off in Louisville, of course. So I thought the, um, the Louisville kid, yeah. no, no, wait, the Louisville, I think that was the, the title I came up with, the Louisville kid, the evolution of Cassius Clay, which is the subtitle. I like what that. What do you think? You like I it? like that. Sounds smooth. When you say Louisville kid, you know, it ties into the town a little bit and like, you know, the whole That's what I got. baseball Louisville. and sports and all that. And he was the icon right. of the town. So yeah, so absolutely. Now, and then the last question was the evolution of Cassius Clay or the evolution of Muhammad Ali. What do you think? Um, yeah, go if you know. I think it's the evolution of Cassius Clay because you got to start with the foundation. He was I agree. Cassius. He was Cassius before Muhammad. That's what I say. So we'll see if the publishers agree because they'll think of things in marketing like no one's going to Google Cassius Clay. They Google Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Yeah. We'll see. So the Louisville kid's a winner. Okay. I just thought of this last night. So I thought, let me ask somebody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Start with the foundation. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Hannah, I think you got a lot to say, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more of your voice in the future. And I appreciate you coming on the show. And thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Yes. It was a lot of fun. And I appreciate all the stories. And yeah. this is Hannah Ali daughter of Muhammad Ali, and I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bain Productions. 